I am delighted to have the privilege of introducing Professor John Norton Moore of the University of Virginia. He's one of the most distinguished scholars in the fields that we've been talking about for the past two days. He's the Walter L. Brown Professor of Law at the University of Virginia and director of that school's Center for Law and National Security. He's also a former ambassador and a former chairman of the ABA's Standing Committee on Law and National Security. Uh, he most recently served as uh, special counsel before the International Court of Justice in the uh, case involving the United States role in Nicaragua. Unlike some of his colleagues, he was uh, defending the uh, role of the United States in, 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 in this matter. Uh, Professor Moore will be speaking on the topic, Foreign Affairs in the Constitution, Do We Have an Imperial Congress? Thank you, Madam Chairman. It is a privilege and a pleasure to have the opportunity to participate in this important national conference. And there is no one that I would rather relinquish uh, time to than Judge Webster, whom I respect greatly. The principle of separation of powers is one of the foundation principles of the great representative democracy which we have in the United States. The framers wisely understood that power corrupts and as such one should structure the fundamental concept of the branches in ways that serve for each branch to have checks on the other branches. Now in a setting that is a post-Watergate, post-Vietnam, post-Church Committee settings, that principle of separation of powers has been primarily invoked against the presidency. Scholars have talked about, quote, an imperial presidency, end quote, and they have urged Congress to undertake a more activist role in foreign policy. Congress has responded to that urging and that mythology of the marketplace of ideas by jumping in with a much more activist involvement in foreign policy. Indeed, an extraordinary enhancement of the congressional role and congressional activism over the past decade and a half. Now, in that setting of greatly enhanced congressional activism, I would like to ask a reverse question for your consideration today. Do we have an imperial Congress? Now that is a question that asks in a fairly robust fashion the more academic issue of what are the checks on the Congress of the United States under the principle of separation of powers as it carries forth its role. No one doubts that Congress has an important role in foreign policy, but I think the more interesting question today, and I hope you will forgive me if I don't dwell on those areas where in fact there has been a significant and important role and an effective role played by Congress in foreign policy, but rather to look at seriously the question of how does separation of powers operate to check the congressional role in foreign policy. Now in doing that I would like to briefly examine four points. The first of those is in a post-Vietnam Watergate Church Committee setting again. What is the evidence of this enhanced congressional activism? The second of those is to examine a series of philosophical and theoretical underpinnings that it seems to me are overly broad as a basis for the enhanced congressional activism in foreign policy. Third, to also very briefly examine some of the ways in which that congressional activism may have been harmful for United States foreign policy, particularly in undermining deterrence or failing 
to add deterrence to American foreign policy. And then finally, I would like briefly to suggest a mechanism, though modest, that I believe can be useful in trying to get a greater balance in this fundamental issue of separation of powers in foreign policy. Now let's turn firstly to this question of has there been an extraordinary explosion in congressional activism in foreign policy over the last 15 years. And here I'm going to give you, in the interest of time, a rather impressionistic sampling. First, we know that Senator Tower has recently compiled in an article in Foreign Affairs an example of some 150 different legal measures in which Congress has sought to place checks on the executive branch. And by the way, that's one of the characteristics of this activism. It is not principally directed at the enemies of the United States abroad or at sending signals abroad on deterrence or even in dealing with American allies abroad but is primarily aimed at checking the executive branch in its conduct of foreign policy. Yet another impressionistic indicator, some 15 years ago one could look to a single volume of statutes compiled by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as concerning, importantly, foreign relations of the United States. Today, it requires some four volumes to compile the same basic category of laws. If we were simply to examine it from the standpoint of the national security lawyer working in this area, then it is particularly striking, just take an area like intelligence counterintelligence law, and everyone working in that field will realize that most of the law in the area is the product of the last 15 years. 15 years ago, courses in this area were almost unheard of, as indeed they were in national security law. Now there is a very substantial uh, rapid engagement with these areas in law school and the work of the organized bar. Now let me just give you a current snapshot as well of some of this activism. Right now, we have a suit by over 100 members of the Congress of the United States directed at the presidency with respect to the applicability of the War Powers Resolution. We've just gone through an extraordinary public hearing by Congress as a form of oversight of a failed covert operation. We have an extraordinary range of activism across virtually every issue in arms control today, uh, most interestingly culminating in the one you just heard in the last debate, an effort by the Senate of the United States and the Congress to tell the executive branch what is the correct interpretation of a treaty of the United States. We have a setting in which the peace plan in Central America, prior to the recent Arias plan, is sponsored by the Speaker of the House of Representatives. It is the Speaker of the House peace plan in Central America. We have a recent setting of a blizzard of amendments from all sides of the political spectrum to the State Department authorization bill as it goes through Congress relating to a whole series of areas in foreign policy. Now with that impressionistic look at some of the enhanced degree of activism, let's turn to this second and more important question to what extent are there philosophical and theoretical underpinnings of this approach that are overly broad and constitutionally suspect and suspect on policy grounds? And here it seems to me there are a series of myths, two affirmative myths and a third myth that we simply don't think about, uh, really a, a myth by omission in the overall discussion. The first of these is the myth of superior congressional wisdom in Vietnam that has had so much to do with this degree of activism. And yet the Congress of the United States was a full party to the Vietnam engagement prior to the Tet Offensive. It voted overwhelmingly, only two votes cast in both houses against the Tonkin Gulf Resolution that, by the way, would have met in every way the requirements of the War Powers Resolution to authorize the war. 
Uh, Congress, within 19 months, overwhelmingly rejected a motion by one of those members of Congress that voted against the Tonkin Gulf Resolution to repeal the resolution. At that point, we had 200,000 troops in Vietnam. Congress, within another year, voted overwhelmingly in both houses for a $12 billion appropriation for Vietnam, a supplemental specifically for Vietnam, when we had yet more troops at the time. The reality is that Congress, as was true with the media, strongly supported American involvement in Vietnam up until the time of the Tet Offensive. And at that point, they, as with the American people, misperceived this battle they witnessed on television as a military defeat, when in fact it was the opposite in terms of the overall conduct of the war. But following that erroneous political perception, Congress began to say this is Mr. Johnson's war and Mr. Nixon's war and not something that the Congress of the United States has had anything to do with. It then proceeded, in my judgment, uh, to, in a post-Vietnam setting, certainly not contribute to the enhancement of deterrence. We forget that we had an end to this war by the Paris Accords, not, by the way, by congressional action, so that Congress did not prevent us from getting into the Vietnam War. Congress did not take the United States out of the Vietnam War. It was ended by the Paris Accords. But Congress did, at that point, pass extraordinarily broad measures that, in my judgment, substantially undercut deterrence for the future in that conflict. As you may recall, after the Paris Accords, then the North Vietnamese built up their mainline tank units, their mainline forces massively, and when the time was right, including after passage by Congress of a resolution that said in advance to the other side, under no circumstances will the United States ever come back in. And by the way, the issue is not whether we should or should not have gone back in in Vietnam. The issue is whether it is wise in terms of deterrence to signal clearly to the North Vietnamese that under no circumstances would the United States react at the same time that you were drawing down dramatically levels of American military assistance to the other side. And we get this blanket law saying under no circumstances we will go back in. In that setting, North Vietnam was so confident that they invaded the South, no ambiguous war here, no ambiguity about legalities or anything else. They invaded the war across the Accord line with 22 out of 23 of their main line units holding back only their uh, anti-coup division around Hanoi. Now in that setting, the South had very little opportunity. That is a record, it seems to me, that does not show superior congressional wisdom in Vietnam. The second myth is a myth of plenary legislative congressional authority. And this has a series of sub-myths. One of these is simply that checks and balances are for the presidency. We think of them in terms of needing to check executive action. Checks and balances are something we think about with respect to the activities of the Congress of the United States. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, as you well know from your constitutional history, that's absolutely wrong. The framers of the United States were as concerned about the concept of an imperial Congress as they were about the concept of an imperial presidency. And they sought to devise a system of checks and balances that operated effectively on both. The second point is the prevailing legal framework for analysis in this area, which is a single barrel framework. It asks the question, if Congress has acted, then is it acting in an area that is an exclusive presidential power? And only if the answer to that is yes, does it then say Congress is exceeding its power. I would submit that the appropriate framework should be a doubled barrel question the first question should be, how does the Congress of the United States have legislative power in this particular area they are seeking to act on? 
And secondly, if they have acted in the area, is it in violation of an area of exclusive presidential authority, such as, of course, uh, directing the troops how to take Port Chop Hill in terms of the commander-in-chief power. Now, why that double-barrel approach? Well, I think that is the appropriate approach because that, ladies and gentlemen, is rooted in the language of the Constitution of the United States. Section 1, Article 1, that gives Congress its powers, says all legislative powers herein granted are given to the Congress of the United States in sharp contrast with Article 2 that includes within the executive power the foreign affairs power and the way it states its grant to the presidency is the executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States of America, not the executive powers herein granted, and Congress did that very deliberately. Now, because of that difference, the principal intellectual forebears of the United States Constitution understood that Congress did not have general plenary authority in foreign affairs. Here's Thomas Jefferson writing in 1790, quote, the transaction of business with foreign nations is executive altogether. It belongs then to the head of that department, except to such portions of it as are specially submitted to the Senate. Exceptions are to be strictly construed. Here is Alexander Hamilton in the Pacificus Exchange a few years later. Quote, it deserves to be remarked that as the participation of the Senate in the making of treaties and the power of the legislature to declare war are exceptions out of the general executive power vested in the president, they are to be construed strictly and ought to be extended no further than is essential to their execution, end quote. In short, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me that the starting point should say, one, does Congress, under an enumerated power, have the ability to legislate in a particular foreign affairs area that's under consideration? And where do they get it? Is it from a specific grant or some reasonable penumbra from a specific grant? And then the second question, have you also, in this particular case, uh, interfered with an exclusive presidential authority and an answer of no or to the first of those or yes to the second should either one disqualify the congressional activism in the area. Now another myth as part of this uh, overall assumption of plenary power is that all of this can be done A under the necessary and proper clause or B under the appropriations power. But ladies and gentlemen, again, a little thought on this shows the intellectual bankruptcy of that argument. If, in fact, any issue of separation of powers can be altered by the necessary and proper clause or by the appropriations power, then we flatly have no principle of separation of powers and Congress has plenary authority. And yet that is not what the Supreme Court has held in the important cases that have dealt with this area, particularly the Myers case in 1926, where the court made exactly the same point made by Jefferson and made by Hamilton as to the difference between the grants of authority in Article I and the grants of authority in Article II. And the notion that the appropriations power can be used on everything flies in the face of a series of attorney general opinions and the concept of unconstitutional conditions. And all you have to do, by the way, to see how silly it is, is apply it to uh, the Bill of Rights. Can you really uh, uh, have some provision that uh, uh, is an obnoxiously racist provision because Congress says we can link it to the appropriations power? And the answer is no. You can ne neither violate the Bill of Rights nor the principle of separation of powers, wherever that line may be, by this concept of we have an appropriation power. Now finally we hear this expressed as an argument that Congress is the democratic branch. Well of course in recent years with a capital D that's frequently been the case. But uh, with respect to a small d it is not a matter of Congress being undemocratic. Of course it's a democratic branch but so is the executive branch. The President of the United States is the only official elected by all of the American people, elected every four years. Uh, 
And that is certainly a democratic process and one with accountability built in. So the notion that one branch is democratic and somehow the other is not in this, it seems to me, is a sham uh, philosophical foundation. Now let's go to the third of the areas of mythology underpinning this congressional activism, and this is mythology by omission. It is a failure to ask what are the functional differences that the framers were aware of that tell us something about where each branch is likely to be most effective and what constraints there ought to be on their degree of activism. And here we note a series of very important reasons why, generally speaking, executive branch is given foreign affairs power. They include greater speed and decisiveness. Let me just give you an example here briefly. After the War Powers Resolution was passed, and after North Vietnam invaded, we had a rapid collapse of the South. President Ford wanted to evacuate some 6,000 Americans. And in the beginning of April 1985, he took an extraordinary measure of inviting the entire Senate Foreign Relations Committee to the White House and addressing a joint session of Congress to ask for authority to go in and rescue the Americans so that he would not be running afoul of the War Powers Resolution or some of the other continuing Cooper Church resolutions in the area. Congress immediately responded and says, of course, Mr. President, we'll help you on this. We agree with it. The Senate took up the, the issue and immediately passed a bill. The House took up the issue and immediately passed another bill. They were different bills. By the way, all of this was done under the expedited procedures of the War Powers Resolution. Uh, they then went to conference, and unfortunately they couldn't agree in conference. By that time, Saigon was being overrun, and so the President simply sent in the Marines and rescued, uh, in a hasty operation, the remaining Americans and some other allies uh, from uh, South Vietnam. Uh, Congress ultimately uh, was not able to pass anything in this area, even after the rescue. In early May, the House ended this debacle by, in fact, voting against decisively the conference report uh, and thereby not giving the President any authority at all under the War Powers Resolution. Now, how about greater secrecy? Uh, that is something that from time to time is important in foreign policy. Let me just give you an example. Does anyone seriously believe that President Carter should have consulted with every member of Congress with respect to the planning for the Iran hostage rescue effort. Uh, the War Powers Resolution does not give you two leaders of Congress to consult with. It says, in every possible instance, with the Congress of the United States. Now, that's the way the law is written. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me that that one is patently absurd on its face. The United States could not have a serious hostage rescue effort in that setting if we had to bring that number of individuals in to the overall process. Now, there's also the question of whether Congress is equipped really to deal effectively in a coordinated foreign policy negotiating sticks and carrots setting. And here I would urge that for the most part, the strength of Congress is to serve as an oversight mechanism and in some extent in foreign policy as a blunt instrument. And that basically uh, what, uh, is what Congress does best. It serves as a fairly effective blunt instrument uh, in a variety of foreign policy linkage settings. I would also urge that Congress can be overly responsive to public opinion. We deliberately created in the United States a representative democracy. And if you will look at the classic um, collection of stories on profiles encouraged by President Kennedy, you will see that many of those are areas in which the members of Congress stood up against uh, pressures from a constituency that were overwhelmingly popular to do one thing at the time and the individual congressman or senator or member of the executive branch said no. And yet, if you look at the performance of Congress as a whole, then I would argue there are at least a variety of settings in which Congress, for foreign policy concerns, may be overly responsive. One of those is the Mayaguez case, rather interestingly, in which, though the law was fairly clear, Cooper Church still in place, 
saying you couldn't go in. The action was very popular and immediately Congress praised the President of the United States in that particular setting. By the way, I think the law was unconstitutional as applied to that, so Congress uh, certainly should have praised the President of the United States. But nevertheless, uh, no raising of Watergate in this one, uh, despite the language of the Cooper Church Amendment saying flatly that you could not send any American forces into Cambodia. Uh, with respect to the Iran hostage rescue effort, President Carter got uh, roundly beaten about the head and shoulders. The operation failed, and Congress uh, did not lose any uh, time in getting in on the, the effort to uh, join the criticism of the president. With respect to Grenada, rather interestingly, Congress uh, or many members of Congress were initially quite hostile, and as the American medical students got off the plane and kissed the ground on the morning television show, and the mood changed overnight in the United States, there was a, an immediate shift in the Congress of the United States with respect to the reaction toward Grenada. I know because uh, they had called me initially to participate in a hearing uh, in response to uh, the Grenada action. They were going to set up a hearing of international lawyers that uh, I think it was assumed would in general be critical of the administration action. I was, I suspect, a token that uh, was going to defend the administration in Grenada. Uh, in any event, I got a call almost immediately after the mood changed in the country saying that the hearings had been called off. Uh, I, I took my uh, remarks and put it in book form, so they, they did me a service. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be very, very brief in the last two points in about uh, three minutes here. Um, this third point is, it seems to me that there is a sharp difference in the role that Congress played in the 1950s and 1960s and the role that it's been playing in the 1970s and 1980s with respect to deterrence, a fundamental component of American foreign policy if we wish to avoid war in the world. Now in the 50s and 60s we had a series of congressional resolutions that said Congress was joined with the President of the United States in putting foreign nations on notice that you better not attack a particular country or attack the United States in a particular area. What we have had since then has been a dramatic reversal in which most of the congressional activism has been directed at the President of the United States to say, Mr. President, there are a series of things you must not do. Now, I'm not arguing whether all of these on the merits are good or bad or things that I would agree with or not. I'm simply saying that difference can have a profound effect on deterrence as one begins to signal in advance to one's adversaries a series of settings in which the presidency under no circumstances would be permitted to act. And just to give you uh, two of these very briefly, one, the Angola setting in which uh, President Ford was having some success in getting the Soviets to back down in pouring in Cuban forces and supplies to the, uh, uh, the Marxist insurgents in Angola. Uh, the Clark and the Tunney amendments were passed and immediately the airlift resumed from the Soviet Union uh, to Angola and we know the end of that story uh, in terms of the numbers of Cuban expeditionary forces that were put in. Central America is another very good example. Uh, if you look at the principal role of Congress in this area, it has been to focus on United States involvement and United States response. The levels of conditionality on United States assistance to El Salvador. Uh, the uh, kinds of support, if any, which Congress will provide for the Contras. Uh, one finds strikingly absent from that anything saying to either Cuba or to Nicaragua, stop your secret war against neighboring states and the Congress of the United States is joined with the presidency in saying the continuation of that secret war documented by our own congressional committees is inappropriate and the United States will not stand for it in the OAS region. Now in conclusion, let me just suggest a very modest proposal uh, as to how we might 
better get at the separation of powers in foreign policy rather than having the activism come solely in this area from Congress itself passing a series of, of measures over the veto of the President of the United States, as was the case with the War Powers Resolution. Now, the mechanisms that exist now aren't terribly good. Uh, one mechanism, Congress just continues to do this. It examines everything. It will pass these laws. Problem with that is there's a major paradox inherent in it. Congress cannot change the principle of separation of powers or where the lines are in the Constitution. If the war power changes it one iota, the war powers resolution is unconstitutional insofar as it seeks to change it. Uh, and by the way, yet another paradox is uh, uh, in an era in which we quickly invoke the rule of law and the Watergate principle against the President of the United States, Congress continues to invoke the War Powers Resolution despite the fact that it is at least in part unconstitutional after the Chatta case. I don't know of a serious argument that says that Section 5C is not struck down after Chatta and probably Section 5B of the resolution, not even looking directly at the War Powers separation of powers problems with a War Powers Resolution. And yet, where is the rule of law consideration in which Congress is examining that as to uh, whether they have an unconstitutional act which they're seeking to apply? There's also a problem here if Congress simply enacts its own view, infusing a potential crisis just when the nation can least afford it. Because the presidency is sworn under the Constitution to protect the constitutional powers of the presidency of the United States, just as Congress is. And if all of these legislative lines passed over presidential veto are done by Congress writing its view, then you potentially have a crisis setting in which the president must choose against an enormous brouhaha with threats of, uh, of uh, impeachment and everything else when he goes directly against Congress, or on the other hand, accepting an erosion of his own constitutional responsibilities. Now, we could perhaps have this done in the courts, and I am in favor of appropriate cases in this area uh, to be considered by the Supreme Court, and I am hopeful that this is one thing that will make a contribution, but I don't believe that's the ultimate answer. There are a series of case and controversy problems, political question problems, the difficulty is we'll have a focus solely on the legal issues and it will be case by case only. All of the restraints of judicial action. Now what I would suggest as this modest proposal, as a way of getting the executive branch into this process of trying to obtain balance, is to establish a national commission that would be a bipartisan, joint, presidential, congressional commission half the members appointed by the presidency of the United States, half the members appointed by the Congress of the United States, a quarter from either house, which will have a broad mandate to look at this whole area of separation of powers in foreign policy and to try to make some recommendations as to how we can structure things to work more effectively together in foreign policy. We can deal both with the legal issues in such a commission and with the policy issues in such a commission. I'm aware of all the downside of this. Well, come on, it's just another commission, and commissionmanship is the classic way to avoid the issue. Well, I think there are some reasons here why a commission is a very useful way to go. One is, in the absence of that, we are left with one of the other fora or the other two fora, and having Congress alone basically draw these lines, it seems to me, is inherently wrong in terms of separation of powers and the principle that no branch can be the judge of its, or the sole judge of its own powers in these particular kinds of settings. Well, we don't have time to go into any more of the details, but uh, I did want to at least uh, convey to you uh, a brief map of some of the problems, it seems to me, that exist in the current degree of congressional activism in foreign policy. Thank you.
thank, thank you, Professor Moore. Please proceed immediately to lunch. Uh, Director Webster is here, and we want to get started as promptly as possible.